Steve Scott, Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer, Cray. Supercomputing Technologies and Trends. Where do we go from here? Hi, it's uh, great to be here and honored to be uh, asked to speak at this event. What I'd like to do is talk a little bit about where we've been in computing, the progress we've made in the past 75 years, how technology drives architecture, and then a glimpse into where we might be going in high-performance computing. Uh, so we, we have to start off by, by remarking on the incredible progress we've made since Konrad Zusa made the Z3. This was introduced in 1941. It was approximately a quarter flop machine with a mix of adds and, and, and multiplies, and it had less than 200 bytes of memory. About 35 years later, we had the Cray-1, uh, the first what many people consider the modern su supercomputing uh, era, introduced in 76. Uh, and compared to the Z3, it had a billion times as much computational speed and about 50,000 times more memory. Uh, fast forward another 38 years, uh, and right here in Berlin, we have what would be considered a medium-sized computer today, the Conrad system uh, at Z ZIB, uh, and it has uh, close to 5 million billion times more computational power uh, than the orig original uh, Zusa Z3, and it has uh, close to a half a trillion times more memory. Uh, we computer scientists l tend to think about computing in, in powers of a thousand. Uh, and so in 1989, we had the first computer that achieved um, one gigaflop on the, uh, an application used to benchmark computers known as LINPACs, basically dense linear uh, matrix multiplication. Uh, and then about a uh, little bit less than 10 years later, uh, we had the first uh, Linpack teraflop, and a couple years later, uh, the first sustained application teraflop, a trillion operations every second. About 10 years later, we had the first uh, Linpack petaflop. This is 10 to the 15 operations per second. Uh, and then the first sustained application petaflop um, later that same year. So we would expect to see another decade later, another power of 1,000, another factor of 1,000 larger, uh, an exaflop computer. And of course, we've seen this chart before. This is the, the top 500 numbers, uh, seeing the, the number one system in the world, the number 500 system in the world in the sum, and we get this beautiful extrapolation, and people think that we should be hitting an exaflop computer in late 2019. Uh, the issue, of course, is that you can see already that we're starting to see some deviations and we're not in improving at the, at the same rate that we were. And we should also keep in mind that this number one system has not been at equal cost power or size. Uh, it's over 80, the, the current number one system is over 80 times the power uh, of the original number one system and many times more expensive, many times larger. So we have to start looking at technology and, and ask ourselves, why is this happening? Uh, so technology really drives architecture. Let's go back to that Cray-1. Uh, it was built out of something called a, a 5-4 NAND gate, two logic gates, not that much more complex than the units that, were, that, the, that the Z3 was, was built out of. Uh, this entire computer was a single processor made with 75,000 gates. Uh, it, it used a risk design, some people say really invented by Seymour Cray, but a very simple design because it was limited in the number of, of available transistors that it had, and it used a, a, a technique called vector instructions, uh, which also allowed you to do a lot of computation with very low control overhead. Uh, but then the world gave us CMOS technology and a, a, a virtual bounty of transistors. Uh, so by 1993, we had the Intel Pentium processor. Uh, it used CMOS transistors. It had three million transistors still just to build a single processor. It used a very complex instruction set design. Uh, and this, this bounty of transistors continued, and, and it brought us eventually to the Intel Pentium 4, uh, which was about the most complex single processor ever built. It had 184 million transistors for just one processor. It had a 31-stage pipeline, a very, very complicated machine. Uh, it was clocked at a very high, uh, uh, very high rate. Um, but it turns out that this was really the last of its breed, and we've now become constrained by power. Moore's law is alive and well for the next 10, maybe 15 years, 
but we've stopped the ability to keep up with Moore's law in terms of power efficiency. It used to be that every time you shrunk the size of a transistor in, in half, uh, you'd get four times as many transistors on a chip, you could clock it twice as fast, and you get eight times the computational performance at absolutely equal power. We, we, we leveraged this for decades. Uh, now we can no longer keep dropping the voltage of transistors, and the power, is not, power efficiency isn't keeping up, and so now we're limited by power efficiency. In fact, if, if we took all the transistors we could fit on a chip and ran them as fast as we could, the chip would literally burn up. Um, and so what has been the architectural response to this? Well, the first thing we decided to do is quit trying to throw all those transistors at a single processor. So instead, let's use simpler processors, somewhat simpler processors, and let's just put several of those processing cores uh, onto a chip. Uh, shortly thereafter, we started realizing that we could exploit the technology that was being developed for graphics uh, and use that for computing. And so the GPU computing uh, that, that NVIDIA has been driving uses a, a very large number of very, very simple processors. Again, trying to use our transistors for parallelism instead of running a single thread faster. And we've also seen the re-emergence of vector processing. Oops. Uh, excuse me. Thank you. We've also seen the reemergence of vector processing uh, with processors such as the Intel Xeon Phi, um, which is, again, applying vectors, in this case, not because we're limited by transistors or logic gates like we were in the Cray-1 days, but now we're limited by power, and so we need another way of making high computational throughput with very low control overhead. Um, we've entered an era now where computers simply aren't getting any faster. They're only getting wider all of the, uh, the increase in performance is coming through parallelism, not through making individual things faster. And this has tremendous implications for programmers. It's becoming much more challenging to program these, the, these faster computers. Uh, we can see this pretty dramatically by, again, looking back historically. Uh, the Z3 in 1941 had a single processor to program. Uh, albeit by punching holes in, in, in film strip, which is a little bit more complicated than it is today, but one processor. Uh, the Cray-1, again, 35 years later, one processor. Uh, the most powerful computer on the planet today is a computer called the Tianha uh, 2 system in China, and it has over 3 million processors uh, in, in, in a single computer. Uh, we now have a pretty good view of what the end of the CMOS era is going to look like as we try to get to an exascale computer, uh, 10 to the 18 operations per second. We'll comfortably get there. We will not, however, get to a zetascale computer, 10 to the 21 operations using classical CMOS. Um, CMOS uh, is running out of steam. Moore's Law is coming to uh, an end sometime in the next 10 to 15 years. The rate of progress has already slowed uh, because of the end of the, the, the voltage scaling that I talked about earlier. We can see our way on a, on a single node or a single chip to maybe getting 10 teraflops of performance to up to perhaps 50 teraflops uh, of performance over the next decade. And this will be done either by using wide vector computations or by using GPUs. Uh, the memory systems are uh, uh, very challenging uh, because of the energy it takes to move data. It turns out that moving data takes a lot more energy than, than computing on that data. And so what we're going to see is the memory systems moving from off of the processor onto the, onto the processor package. Uh, their technology is called high bandwidth memory, which uses 3D stacks of memory technologies directly onto, on a substrate within the same package that the processor's on. It gives you about an order of magnitude more memory bandwidth uh, and an order of magnitude better energy efficiency, so it takes much less energy to access each byte of data. Uh, so we're going to see over the next few years pretty much all computers moving to on-package memory. Um, uh, we're also seeing some, some improvements in storage technology. Uh, disks, which have long been the storage media of processors, are really going to be relegated to cold archival storage, and increasingly, even in large-scale computers, uh, flash memory storage, which is really the, the memory that's the, the, the storage that you have in, in your mobile phones, is going to become ubiquitous, is going to become the main storage media for computers. And then we have new technologies such as phase change memory or, or Intel's 3D crosspoint shown here, uh, that will provide even faster uh, uh, performance than we get with flash memory. We can put reasonably about 100,000 uh, high-performance computing nodes into a single machine. Uh, this might take something on the order of, uh, uh, you know, half of a, of a soccer field uh, in terms of, of area. Uh, it would be 
in the next several years, when you get to an exaflop, maybe around 30 megawatts of power. Uh, it would involve anywhere from 10 to 100 million individual threads of computation. But such a machine is going to max out at less than 10 exaflops. Now, we could, uh, if, uh, if we wanted to, build uh, 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 even larger machines. We could say, let's build 100 megawatt machines. Let's build a gigawatt machine. Historically, we've never wanted to do that because it would be silly, because a few years later, we'll get a faster machine, and so it wouldn't make any sense to spend that much money on a computer. If uh, we don't uh, reach the new technology beyond CMOS, then it may start making sense to go larger than this system and build some truly uh, uh, monumental uh, computing devices. We also have a pretty good idea about how to connect these things together. Uh, the, the interconnection networks, which are really the backbone of a supercomputer that control how all the data uh, is exchanged between the different computing nodes and tie these 100,000 nodes together. Uh, we know how to design one now that's very, very cost uh, efficient uh, and very power efficient using a mix of electrical signaling and, and optical signaling. And so we have an idea what these last CMOS computers will look like. And they won't, frankly, look all that much different than today's uh, systems. Now, I've been talking about uh, very high-end computers, but in a sense, you can think of high-end technology water falling down to, to smaller scales as well. So if we, can, if we can buy an exaflop computer for, say, 250 million euros, that also means that you'd have a, a petaflop computer available uh, for maybe 250,000 euros and a teraflop computer available for uh, maybe 250 euros. Um, I should also note that most people uh, they don't interact directly with high-end computers, but in the future, most people are not even going to interact with, with um, small departmental computers. The way that most people will interact with computers in the future uh, is via the model that was hinted at in a couple of the other presentations. It's really talking to your phone or to your tablet or to your laptop, and you think of that thing as providing the computation. And in fact, some computation does happen locally on that device, but most of the computation is happening hidden behind in the cloud in these very large data centers. And these very large data centers actually look fairly similar to the high-end computers that, that we build uh, to do scientific computation. There are some differences, uh, although the scale is similar. These computers are designed to do lots and lots and lots of relatively small tasks. They're not particularly good, these data centers, at doing one very large uh, calculation, say, in support of climate, climate research or, or other scientific missions. Uh, but we're, we're going to have this, this model in the future where you're interacting with what you think is a computer, but there's a lot of computation going on behind that. Uh, so let's talk just a little bit about what happens at the, uh, at the end of this CMOS era. Um, if we look back historically, this is a chart that many people have probably seen from Ray Kurzweil. We can actually look back uh, over 100 years, and we see this exponential improvement in computing power over time. Uh, this is the computations of the calculations that can be done per second per thousand dollars of, of cost, so equal cost. And originally we had uh, electromechanical tabulating devices, uh, the sort of thing you do to, to automate um, counting or adding of a, of a lot of numbers, basically uh, little uh, mechanical adding machines. Uh, then we moved to relay computers, and the, the Z3, of course, was a relay-based machine. Uh, and then we moved beyond that technology to vacuum tubes, uh, these early computers that we saw in the, in the 1950s that were room-sized behemoths uh, filled with vacuum tubes uh, that, that could operate much more quickly than electromechanical relays could operate. Uh, and then eventually we moved beyond that to transistors. Um, very, you know, discrete transistors with uh, uh, the ability to switch on and off a, a logic gate based on uh, a, a, a control signal, uh, and they could operate much more, fa much uh, faster than vacuum tubes. Uh, they could also operate much more reliably than vacuum tubes. And then finally, we got the integrated circuit, and the integrated circuits, uh, starting off in in, in around the. Uh, uh, early 70s all the way up to today uh, have provided exponentially more transistors, as, as Moore's Law ha has described. But as I just described earlier, we are reaching the end of the CMOS era. Uh, sometime in the, in the next decade, uh, CMOS will run out of gas. 
uh, and we'll have to have some new technology. So starting from the 30s and moving on beyond that, what will that technology be? Well, we don't really know the answer to that. There are a lot of very good researchers that are looking into a lot of different technologies. Um, carbon nanotubes and graphene are two different forms of, of carbon uh, that look like they have a lot of promise, maybe more promise as a memory technology than as a computing technology, uh, but they're, they're definitely um, strong indications that we may be able to harness these different forms of carbon uh, to do computing not only faster but with less energy. Um, maybe we'll use quantum computing. Uh, we, we now have a couple of computers that, for, you know, IBM, uh, D-Wave, uh, that are looking to actually be quantum computers. They're not useful yet uh, by any means. Um, you, can, you can do anything in the world that you can envision faster on a classical computer than you really can on a quantum computer, but uh, extend the number of qubits a little bit further, make it, uh, make it uh, you know, reproducible and effective to use, and there are certain problems in factoring of large numbers, in, in search optimization, etc., uh, that will fall to quantum computing very nicely. It will not be a general purpose um, uh, computational mechanism. You're not going to simulate the, the uh, airflow of an airplane wing with a quantum computer, uh, but you may be able to do certain things very, very well. Optical computing is another area uh, that there may be some promise because optical computing would, would take less energy. Um, it's really the, the, the power that's limiting us uh, in, in today's integrated circuits. Um, and then possibly even reversible logic. If you think about it from a pure theoretical sense, uh, there's mathematics that basically says any time you perform uh, a, a computation that destroys the original input information, um, you have inherently spent a certain amount of energy. We're still many orders of magnitude away um, from that limit, but there is this limit uh, that ultimately says if you destroy the input information, you will inherently spend energy to do so. And so there's theoretical work that says adiabatic computing, or basically reversible computing, which is a form of computing in which you can take inputs to compute outputs, but given those same outputs, you could compute in reverse back to gain the original inputs. You've not lost information, and therefore you have not uh, inherently spent energy. And there are people that are thinking theoretically about building machines uh, using this reversible or adiabatic uh, logic. So we just don't know, uh, and, and frankly, um, we don't know not only what the future technology will be beyond CMOS, we don't know if there will be a, a future technology beyond CMOS. So as we think about the future of, of high-performance computing, of, of computing in general, how that future turns out is largely going to be dependent upon whether or not we make this leap, like we did from relays to vacuum tubes to transistors to integrated circuits. Can we make the next leap from CMOS to something else which allows us to continue this exponential uh, rate of improvement? If we can, if we see in the next 75 years the same level of improvement in computing technology that we've seen in the past 75 years, then the future is going to be astounding. Computers will become immensely, immensely capable. It will be a transformation unlike anything humanity has ever seen. By the end of this century, we'll have uh, high-performance computing embedded in the fabric of everything, highly networked. The fastest computers will be, by uh, any measure, far, far, far more powerful uh, than the human brain. Will we be able to uh, harness that computing power and, and achieve superintelligence? Experts can uh, debate this subject, but the, a growing consensus is yes. And I think that the, the, recent, uh, the recent advances in machine learning that, that Steve Oberlin just talked about a few moments ago are, are kind of a hint of, of the sorts of things that can be done uh, with computing power, and if you think about orders of magnitude, another billion, another trillion times faster computing power. Uh, it's very, very likely. Um, that said, <coughs> uh, we don't know that this is going to happen. Uh, I'm hopeful. Uh, there's no guarantee that we're going to make that leap. If we don't, then the golden age of the computer architect will be upon us. Uh, it will be incumbent upon computer architects to do more and more with the same logic. We may design bigger and bigger systems, but we will reach a plateau. Uh, and Personally, I think that would be somewhat sad. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.